Walking with Dinosaurs Truly Was Revolutionary. Created by Tim Haynes and produced by the BBC in 1999, the series received critical acclaim following its initial broadcast, winning two BAFTAs and earning six Primetime Emmy Awards nominations, as well as further cementing the fascination of these ancient animals to the world, introducing thousands of people like myself to the wonderful world of the Mesozoic. And even long after its initial debut and a wide variety of prehistory-based documentaries following a suit, arguably none have been able to top this classic piece of television. But how does it hold up today? Is this series as good as we remember it, or has it simply become a relic of a bygone age? Let's find this out and more at the start of our journey, all the way back in the Triassic with new blood. <laughs> The first episode of Walking with Dinosaurs, New Blood, is a great introduction to the miniseries and to the titular dinosaurs. The episode details the rise of the dinosaurs and how they came to dominate the Earth, following the animals of the Triassic as a metaphorical arms race plays out over the course of the episode, which will determine which group of animals will inherit the Earth. The landscape the Triassic presents is both bleak and beautiful, with a contrast between the dry season and wet season being very apparent. The filming location of New Caledonia is absolutely perfect for this episode, and when looking at the flora and the environments the episode presents, it really makes you feel like a film crew actually went back in time to the Triassic. And this is just one of the many advantages Walking with Dinosaurs has. The real filming locations make the events that happen in the episodes feel more real, and it is a great source of immersion. The segments with the female Postosuchus are the highlights of the episode, who are being introduced as a formidable predator as the ruler of her environment, striking fear into both the animals around her and the audience with her size and ferocity, which alongside a very fitting theme, makes her a truly intimidating presence. As the episode progresses, the Postosuchus goes through a tragic arc and is gradually made sympathetic, from her being wounded in an encounter with the Placerius, as well as her losing her territory to a rival, her downfall all culminating in her death, with her collapsing and being eaten by the very animals she once instilled fear into. The death of the Postosuchus is one of the more emotional moments of the show, and although not the most poignant scene the show has to offer, it's still a well-made scene, even if the Postosuchus animatronic does look a bit strange at times. Postosuchus as a whole, however, looks excellent, possessing one of the greatest models in the show, being complemented with great texturing and coloration, as well as a great model. Coelophysis, the main dinosaur species the episode focuses on, like the previously mentioned Postosuchus, has a fantastic model and coloration, as well as having great animations and personality. The Coelophysis themselves are the sign that the dinosaurs are beginning to take a hold in their environment. This is showed throughout the episode as an individual is initially focused on, and as it progresses, more and more animals are shown on screen, and as showed at the end of the episode, the Coelophysis have essentially become a massive swarm that is sweeping up and usurping all of the other Triassic animals, heralding the arrival of the Mesozoic and the reign of the dinosaurs. As well as the dinosaurs and other reptiles, the episode also takes time to focus on a pair of cynodonts, synapsids that are constantly pressured by Coelophysis throughout the episode, eventually having to sacrifice their own young in order to preserve their own lives. The aforementioned scene is handled well, given the subject matter, and the scene itself is not made overly dramatic, presenting the occurrence as a natural event, just like in any modern nature documentary. To us, such an act is unthinkable, but to the Cynodonts, it is critical to their survival, and is the only way for the two parents to survive, even if their young have to be sacrificed. This is a commendable thing for the documentary to show, considering that the series has the creative freedom to tell unique stories, as the animals featured are long since extinct. The team behind the documentary could have just scrapped the scene altogether in favour of censorship, but instead they told what they wanted to tell and show what they wanted to show, regardless of the reaction that people would have. The natural world is something that shouldn't have to be censored, as doing so would be blatant ignorance, even if some people wouldn't want to know such things exist. 
Walking with Dinosaurs understands this and doesn't hold back with its visuals and stories, and this scene is a clear example of such understanding. There isn't much wrong with the episode, but a minor issue that does affect it is the narrative of the dinosaurs winning out over the other reptiles that existed in the Triassic. While dinosaurs did survive the Triassic extinction event, it doesn't necessarily mean that they were any better adapted for their environment than their contemporaries, as was shown in the episode. In reality, dinosaurs were merely lucky survivors of the extinction event, and the other reptiles in the episode that were deemed as more primitive, such as the Postosuchus and Placerias, were not these relics of a bygone age like the episode suggests. Even though this was not known at the time, Postosuchus is now known to have been a bipedal animal, much unlike the Postosuchus depicted in Walking with Dinosaurs, meaning that the bipedal stance adopted by the dinosaurs was not unique to the group but instead being more commonplace amongst other archosauromorphs. At first glance, many of these non-dinosaurian reptiles look surprisingly similar to the dinosaurs that would follow them, some even being mistaken for dinosaurs when they were first discovered. These striking similarities between the two groups suggest that members of the two groups likely shared similar lifestyles, meaning that they were also competing for the same resources. Despite this, as its own self-contained story within the documentary, the episode still works fine if this criticism is pushed to the wayside. And even then, I wouldn't say it outright ruins the episode, as it has enough good things going for it that balances this negative out, which goes for all of the other episodes really, as all of them have inaccuracies, whether they be large or small. Overall, New Blood is a great introductory episode for the series, and sets the foundations of the style Walking with Dinosaurs is going for. The second episode, Time of the Titans, is likely to be the most iconic and well-recognised episode, and for good reason. Taking place in the Morrison Formation of late Jurassic North America, the episode mainly focuses on a female Diplodocus and the rest of her clutch through their first moments as hatchlings to their struggles on the open plains, facing danger from both the animals around them and their environment. The episode is simple in structure, and even while following a main dinosaur character, the episode still takes its time to showcase other animals and their own day-to-day -day lives. Time of the Titans has a large ensemble of well-known animals from the Jurassic, from the iconic green and spiny Diplodocus to the red-crested Allosaurus, the reconstructions of these animals in particular are iconic, and are likely known by people who may not have even seen the documentary. The Diplodocus themselves, being the standout animals of the episode, are fittingly majestic, which is further enhanced by the sounds given to the sauropods, which are given deep and beautiful bellows, which is fitting for such an imposing animal. This is also the perfect time to bring up Benjamin Bartlett's score, which across all of the series is fantastic, but especially so in this episode. Arguably the most iconic piece featured in the documentary is found here, and this particularly grandiose theme encapsulates all of what makes dinosaurs so spectacular to us. Slowly building and building into a magnificent piece of music that makes listening to the score feel like you're witnessing the awe and majesty of these animals, and what it might have been like to be alongside them. The score of Time of the Titans itself is rather reminiscent of Stravinsky, Shostakovich, and other notable classical composers, with long, sweeping harmonies that grab your attention and enthrall you into the mystical and mysterious world of the Jurassic, giving the episode a beautiful, but also primordial and otherworldly feel that is greatly inspired by the classical greats of the past. The Diplodocus are contrasted musically by the Allosaurus, which are accompanied by fitting, unnerving music that is a great foil to the peaceful and flowing theme of the Diplodocus. As an example, as a pair of Allosaurus stalk the canyon in a tense scene that slowly builds up and then back down to the peaceful notes of the sauropodlets, the music is then quickly thrown into disarray and panic as the Allosaurus reach the crash, giving the scene a very unsettling and traumatic feel. The influences from Stravinsky and others like him are also apparent for when the Allosaurus charge, with a sudden, blaring opening, which I find myself to be one of the best pieces in the documentary. Take a listen.
Going back to the dinosaurs and other animals, they all hold up okay when compared to what we currently know of dinosaur life appearance, although there are some problems here and there. The first animal that comes to mind is the Anurognathus, and really everything about it. It's in the wrong area, North America instead of Germany, has a completely different lifestyle from what we know of, although the idea of small pterosaurs living on sauropods is an interesting idea. As well as this, the anatomy is also off, which made an already very interesting looking pterosaur into a more generic one, which is quite a shame, but the animal didn't have too much screen time, so it's not the worst thing in the world. The Allosaurus also appear more robust than what we know from specimens, and have the wrong skull shape, although this would be fixed somewhat in the Ballad of Big Al a year later. The Diplodocus are depicted with a more horizontal posture, which was a part of a heavily discussed topic in how sauropods held their necks up. The documentary ultimately went with a more accepted horizontal posture, although nowadays a vertical posture is more likely given that's their closest relatives, birds and crocodiles, possess more vertically neutral neck posture, so it is likely that sauropods had this same posture as well, even in the more inflexible necked Diplodocus. So unless sauropods carried their heads and necks differently from every living group of land vertebrates, through Occam's razor, a more vertically postured Diplodocus is more likely. Time of the Titans overall is still a fantastic episode from the show, showcasing the majesty of the dinosaurs in an unparalleled way and is most deserving of its iconicity. Crawl C is a quality episode in Walking with Dinosaurs, as it is one of two episodes in the series to focus primarily on the non-dinosaur animals of the Mesozoic, which gives the documentary a chance to explore the animals that existed alongside the dinosaurs, and offer a perspective on the other environments of the prehistoric world. The episode follows the fauna of not just the sea, but the air and land, showing how these different animals all in some way rely on the ocean for their survival, whether it be island-faring theropods or the high-flying Rampharynchus. The episode utilises its aquatic setting to full effect, showing some absolutely stunning shots, from Ophthalmosaurus leaping out of the water and hunting squid in the night, to two Liopleurodon confronting each other, it's really a beautiful episode to look at, and stands out because of it. Crawl Sea also has a brilliant atmosphere that makes the ocean out to be both a beautiful spectacle and a terrifying abyss. This atmosphere is emphasised with the music present in the episode, which features large, affecting pieces that use the slow building swells of strings interspersed with steady bass notes and shimmering celesta to illustrate the hardships of the marine reptiles, as well as utilising strings, orchestral harp and bass, to form a picture in our heads that fits perfectly in how we view the ocean itself, a beautiful but also mysterious and terrifying place all at once, which I think this soundtrack perfectly sells as being both serene and unsettling all at once. The episode also has a brilliant subversive opening that shows that the ocean is an unforgiving place, tying into the episode's title, as well as at the end of the episode, where the Eustriptus spondylus turn the tables on the beached Liopleurodon, showing how even the most invincible of animals are still vulnerable to their unpredictable and dangerous world. Like the rest of the series, Crawl Sea has inaccuracies, although more apparent ones compared to the others, such as Cryptoclidus on the land and skim-feeding pterosaurs, but then of course, there's the elephant in the room, or in this case, the oversized pliosaur in the room, that's being the absolutely massive Liopleurodon. The Liopleurodon known in the fossil record are estimated to be an average 5-7 to seven metres in length, so how did the documentary end up presenting these animals of lengths of 25 metres? The Liopleurodon featured in Walking with Dinosaurs was based on an isolated vertebra about 25 centimetres wide, which was initially thought to belong to a Cetiosaurid, and was later reassigned as a pliosaur vertebrae at a later date by Colin McHenry. Based on this vertebra, it was then compared to a Chronosaurus specimen, which was estimated as over 13 metres back then, resulting in an estimation of a pliosaur of around 18 metres. This specimen was assigned to Liopleurodon, due to it being the most well-known pliosaur in the region the fossil was found, and was further scaled up to 25 metres, as the vertebrae was thought to not belong to a fully grown animal, resulting in the ridiculously large Liopleurodon featured in the documentary. 
Nowadays, these estimates were not shown to be very accurate, but the Walking with Dinosaurs Liopleurodon still exists to show people one of the most ridiculous examples of erroneous scaling in paleontology. As mentioned earlier, the episode really does have some of the best sequences and shots in the documentary, including the Eustriptospondylus ramphorhynchus hunt and the Cryptoclidus chasing schools of fish. The Cryptoclidus themselves were placed over footage of tuna to emulate them attacking the school, so that the movements of the fish would still respond in the same way to a large presence, even while using CGI. All of this, as well as the superb use of CGI and animatronics, makes Crawl C one of the best episodes featured in the documentary, in spite of its whale-sized pliosaurs. Giant of the Skies, the fourth episode in the series, goes from detailing the Mesozoic Oceans to the skies, primarily focusing on the pterosaurs. The episode follows a male Ornithochiris and one of his flights to his mating grounds, which the episode foreshadows to be his last flight. The Ornithochiris goes through hardships, such as being grounded by the weather and being weakened by parasites, as well as encountering other animals as he ventures, some more dangerous than others. Eventually, he manages to arrive at his destination, but is unable to reach his preferred display area, and being old and not as fit as he used to be, is forced to display on the edges of the breeding grounds, where he slowly dies on the beach through heat stroke and exhaustion. The episode, quite unlike the others in the series, has a more plot-driven narrative, as it follows one particular animal, which was done in Time of the Titans with the female Diplodocus, but in that case, the story didn't focus all too much time on her, as the episode took more time to feature the other animals of the Jurassic. Giant of the Skies does this well, but never strays too far off of the male Ornithochiris, always keeping him relevant throughout, with increased screen time and background presence compared to other animals in the series, so that any and all deviations from him and his story don't feel like abrupt breaks. Because of this, Giant of the Skies, like Crawl Sea before it, is a standout instalment in the series, not just because it focuses on other non-dinosaur animals, but also due to its heavy atmosphere, which is punctuated by the fantastic Ornithochiris theme, which varies depending on the mood the episode wants to present, from dramatic for the Ornithochiris' first appearance, adventurous for when the Ornithochiris flies across the Earth's oceans, and heartbreaking for when the Ornithochiris finally meets his end. Even while you know what the Ornithochiris' face is from the beginning of the episodes, the death of the Ornithochiris is a profound scene, accompanied by very saddening strings and violin, and makes the death even more emotional, enhancing the already saddening mood. The episodes, like all of the ones before and after it, has its fair share of inaccuracies. From relatively minor ones, like the posture of pterosaur arms and their strength, to Iguanodon being a worldwide genus, which was down to its position as a wastebasket taxon at the time, although this inaccuracy wasn't considered one when the documentary was being produced. But then comes the infamous Utah Raptors, which as their name suggests, are found in North America, but are for some reason in Europe for a seemingly unexplained reason. And while this does seem very odd, there is a reason for this. When Iguanodon as a genus was more widespread, and due to it and other animals being found in both North America and Europe, it was fair to assume that Utahraptor would have also been the same, although this didn't take into account that North America and Europe had already separated for millions of years at the time the episode takes place in, hence why the Ornithochiris still flies over the Atlantic Ocean. The Ornithochiris is also far too large, and was based off of fragmentary remains that indicated a potential 12 metre wingspan that ended up being utilised in the documentary. These remains were eventually described in 2012, and were found to belong to an animal with a maximum wingspan of 8.26 metres. The 12 metre estimate, while not as likely, or based on any substantial evidence at the time, was likely chosen by the producers of the series, due to its being more spectacular, which will lead into one of the show's biggest criticisms that I will get into further on in the video. Giant of the Skies is one of the most breathtaking and emotional episodes, and even though there are some issues with it, it still holds up well with its powerful narrative and stunning shot composition. Spirits of the Ice Forest is an episode from the series that is both incredibly unique and overlooked, in that it utilises animals that many people out of the sphere of paleontology wouldn't know about, as well as taking place in an environment that many wouldn't expect dinosaurs to live, 
that's being near the South Pole in what is now Southern Australia. The episode follows a clan of Lee Elanosaura and their struggles throughout their ever-changing environment, from variable seasons to enigmatic predators. The episode to me, and to many others, is quite admirable in that it gives attention to otherwise unknown animals that has not been featured in any sort of media, and even to this day have had little focus, so for such a landmark documentary taking the opportunity to showcase animals that many wouldn't know about is great to see. The animals the episode presents, like Matabarasaurus and Lielanosaurus, are quite fragmentary, so to put them as focuses for an episode showcase that the creators wish to educate first and foremost, in order to show the Mesozoic through a perspective that hasn't been shown before in the media up until this point, instead of going with the more typical animals that are more complete and better known. In terms of the episode's presentation, the episode, aside from the trials of the Lielanosaurus clan, doesn't necessarily have much of a plot, showcasing the adaptations that the plants and animals utilise to survive in their environment, which is in no way a bad thing, as it feels just like an instalment from a present-day nature documentary. The episode also has a relaxing feel to it, and is further punctuated by the fantastic music that accompanies it. The release tracks Spirits of the Ice Forest, Sleeping Lielanosaurus and Antarctic Spring are serene and beautifully made, and the departure of the Matabarasaurus is one of the best pieces in the whole documentary, and is awe-inspiring to listen to. As to be expected, there are inaccuracies here and there, and one of the biggest comes in the form of the Lielanosaurus. The model itself holds up well, but the appearance is completely off from what we now know. Small ornithischians like Lielanosaurus are known to have possessed feathers, and given its Antarctic habitat, the lack of feathers on an assumably cold adapted animal is a little odd to say the least. The next point isn't necessarily an inaccuracy, but the animatronic Lielanosaurus looks quite creepy, with dead looking eyes and cheeks that collapse in on themselves once the mouth is closed. A second inaccuracy is a more interesting one, that's being in what the documentary terms polar allosaurs. These animals were based off of an ankle bone found in Cape Patterson, Victoria, which for the longest time was referred to as a dwarf allosaur, Allosaurus robustus, or what the episode calls them polar allosaurs. In recent years, the allosaurs featured in this episode have been attributed to the genus Australovenator, but this genus wasn't discovered until 2005, well after the series had been made. The ankle bone I mentioned earlier more than likely didn't belong to Australovenator, as the Cape Patterson theropod, as it is named, comes from older rocks and was found further south than the remains belonging to Australovenator. This bone has been found to resemble most closely the controversial Megaraptorans, or potentially an abelosaur, but not belonging to some relict population of Jurassic allosaurs. Near the end of the episode, it is also stated that the climate would cool, driving the polar dinosaurs into extinction, whereas it was actually the opposite effect. The climate around the late Cretaceous continued to get warmer through the Cretaceous Thermal Maximum, and the drop in temperatures around the poles came well after in the Cenozoic. Spirits of the Ice Forest is both an underlooked and underrated instalment of Walking with Dinosaurs, which is likely down to its utilisation of lesser known animals. But aside from that, Spirits of the Ice Forest is a beautiful episode, and definitely deserves some more attention. The final episode in the series, Death of a Dynasty, like Spirits of the Ice Forest before it, has a heavy atmosphere, but instead of being mystical, is desolate and bleak. The culmination of five episodes before it, Death of a Dynasty details the extinction of the non-avian dinosaurs and the end of the Mesozoic, following the last days of the animals living in the now-renowned Hell Creek Formation. As stated earlier, the episode has a very sickening feel to it, and the episode excellently showcases the last day of the dinosaurs, showcasing how it affects the animals and the environment, and really makes it feel like the dinosaurs and the entire planet are on their last legs. The episode has some great highlights, such as the Taurosaurus fight and the Ankylosaurus confrontation, but as it is the end of the Cretaceous and the final episode in a paleo documentary, an extinction scene would of course be present, and is most definitely a standout scene. This extinction scene has been criticised for being too short and not being very dramatic, but really that was the whole point of the scene. Other documentaries in the vein of Walking with Dinosaurs make the extinction scene very dramatic, showing footage of the asteroids and or comets hitting the Earth from space, with a fiery inferno following the impact. 
But in walking with dinosaurs, the extinction is from a dinosaur eye view, experiencing the extinction alongside the audience in a more realistic manner. With no music present, the whole event is very eerie to witness, and the blast front that flows over the mountains is terrifying without being too dramatic, with animals calling out in terror, and having a subtlety to it that leaves it to the imagination as to what the impact was like without even showing it. This more subtle and quick extinction also has another benefit to it, in that, given the context of the episode, the dinosaurs were already suffering due to increased volcanism, and the asteroids hitting the Earth effectively put them out of their misery, literally sweeping them away as if they were nothing, showing the power the impact brought while not being too dramatic, fitting in with the atmosphere and enthralling nature of the documentary. Aside from the well-done extinction scene, inaccuracies still persist, and some animals have quite a few, as we'll get into. The whole premise of the episode, that's the end of the Cretaceous was a time dominated by increased volcanism, is inaccurate. At this time, aside from potentially the Deccan traps in India due to its close proximity to the extinction of the dinosaurs, life in North America and the rest of the world effectively functioned as it has done throughout the Mesozoic, due to there being no substantial evidence that states otherwise, so the animals presented in the episode would have not lived in a suffocating world. The habitat of the Hell Creek formation is also wrong, as from what we know from fossil evidence, Hell Creek was a floodplain environment, with ferns, redwoods and palm trees being prevalent, rather than the ash fields presented in the episode, although the Chilean filming location was chosen due to there being no grass, but even then, it is an inaccuracy nonetheless. The Quetzalcoatl that makes a brief appearance in the episode is also far from what we know of the actual animal. The model's proportions are completely off, even for the time, and even possesses teeth, likely due to the Quetzalcoatl being a reskinned Ornithochiris. But even so, an as dark a pterosaur with teeth is a very poor mistake to make. The oddest design choice in the episode, and the one with the most inaccuracies, is sure to be the Tyrannosaurus, which for being the most famous of all non-avian dinosaurs, was really not done justice. This Tyrannosaurus design is heavily shrink-wrapped, has the wrong head shape, and a short tail that makes the animal looking balanced. The oddest design choice of all comes with the feet, which seem to possess hoofed nails, and overall don't look quite right. The only thing going for the design is the coloration, but aside from that, it's probably the most baffling design choice in the documentary, and especially for the Tyrant Lizard King. All in all, Death of a Dynasty is a great episode, and a perfect end to walking with dinosaurs. And while not my personal favourite episode, it has plenty of memorable moments, and is still an enjoyable experience. Aside from all of the inaccuracies, the episode ends on a more positive note by showcasing that even in today, in a world largely dominated by mammals, birds, being extant dinosaurs, still exist, and shows that really, we are still walking among dinosaurs to this very day. And with that, those are the six episodes of Walking with Dinosaurs reviewed, but since this is a review, I would like to give my conclusion on the series and what I think of it overall. Rewatching Walking with Dinosaurs for this review was a great experience, and really made me love this documentary even more than I already did. This documentary was a truly landmark series when it first aired, and still, even to this day, 20 years after it first aired, it is still a very solid piece of paleo media. Getting into the show's technical aspects, Sir Kenneth Branagh, the narrator of the series, has a brilliant voice that immerses the viewer into the prehistoric world like no other, and was an absolute perfect casting choice if there ever was one for this documentary. Having a wide range of tone and mood in his voice that perfectly fits whatever scene he narrates over. Another fantastic component of the series is the music, which, composed by Benjamin Bartlett, superbly fits with the documentary enhancing the show's atmosphere in making sad moments even sadder, and breathtaking moments even more breathtaking than they already were. I would also like to thank him for discussing the music behind the documentary with me for this video, and I was pleased to have done so. One of the best aspects of the series is that due to the animals being extinct, the team behind the series were able to create narratives and send their animals through trials and journeys that make the episodes connect more with an audience, something that documentaries on extant animals cannot pull off to near the same extent. The real filming locations make the episodes feel very real, and each location nearly perfectly matches from what we know these environments were like back in the Mesozoic, 
utilising locations like New Zealand and Tasmania that still possess more ancient plant lineages that were widespread back in the Mesozoic, but are relatively rare today. In these environments, the team behind the documentary utilises both CG and practical effects to bring the animals to life, scanning in detailed models and then animating them and then realistically fitting them into their respective environments, taking into account shadows and lighting to make the models look as realistic as possible. As well as the use of CGI, the animatronics utilised for close-up shots are highly detailed and well-made, and were done by the special effects company Crawly Creatures, that also did the effects for both the Walking With series and the spin-off series Sea Monsters and Chased by Dinosaurs, and have an incredible attention to detail. The animatronic eyes even move and dilate, and the nostrils can flare, making the animals depicted in the series far more believable than they otherwise would be, even with the good CGI for the time. The documentary is made even more realistic by creating splashes and other miscellaneous effects like the kicking of dirt or the movement of branches before placing in the CG animals, and then placing them over the effect, making it seem like they are interacting with their environment. Even subtle effects like saliva and breath are taken into consideration, making the whole experience more realistic in a subtle way that may go unnoticed, but are a great addition nonetheless. All of this attention to detail shows that the people behind the series wanted to make the best documentary possible about prehistoric life that they could, while also having some fun during the production as well, as shown through the making of Walking with Dinosaurs, which itself brings some great humour. Of course though, even with this high attention to detail, criticism about the show and its presentation was a source of controversy to many. The series was especially controversial with a number of paleontologists in that the show put a big emphasis on speculation and sensationalism rather than using a more factual approach. The creators of the series responded by saying that the goal of the series was to entertain, first and foremost, presenting the prehistoric world as if these extinct organisms were still around today simulating documentaries about extant animals, but still educating the audience on the animals and their adaptations and anatomy in a way that would still fit with the tone of the series. The narratives present in the episodes are present to draw in the viewers in order to make them care about the animals and their stories, and in following with this style, there are no cutaways to paleontologists talking or the narrator simply reading out known facts. The series manages to put in some healthy speculation alongside this, such as biological and behavioural aspects that we will never likely know about, so the presentation of this series really isn't an issue. Theories and information on prehistoric life are always changing, and there was no possible way for everything in the show to hold up years down the line. This isn't to say that the creators didn't care about accuracy, however, as at the time of the series' production, many of the taxonomic and anatomical details of the animals were accurate for the time, and like the creators stated, quite a lot of what they stated in the documentary has changed, but that is merely the progress of science, and not a lack of care. The science behind the series was also covered in the making of Walking with Dinosaurs, and gives some insight into how the series was made. Me calling out some of the inaccuracies in this video may have come off as nitpicking, but it's only because I want to both educate and point out what has changed since 1999, in that the documentary itself is still a great piece of media that, in my opinion, now serves as a gateway to further interest in paleontology and the sciences. Another great aspect of the series is that the dinosaurs and other animals are treated like the living, breathing animals that they once were, the show is peaceful, showcasing the everyday lives of animals during the Mesozoic, and while there are violent and in some cases dramatic scenes, they are realistic in their presentation, and aren't too overdramatic or unbelievable, something that in my opinion has yet to be replicated even today in other paleo documentaries. These animals feel incredibly real, and the presentation of the series succeeds in bringing these animals back to life. Walking with Dinosaurs also had a massive impact on how documentaries about prehistoric life were treated. Before Walking with Dinosaurs, dinosaur behaviour was described more than shown, and were predominantly depicted in static pictures or through their skeletal mounts, and it made it harder to believe that such animals could have really existed. The ambitious use of CGI and animatronics made these animals feel like real organisms, and in my opinion made them easier to grasp and imagine in the process. Every episode of the series is well made and of the highest of quality, and each of the episodes has its own unique feel and atmosphere to it, 
which means that all of the episodes can be watched and enjoyed depending on what the viewer wants to watch. If you want to watch something that is both majestic and beautiful, then Time of the Titans would be ideal. Crawl Sea if you want to be immersed in the heavy atmosphere of the ocean, and Death of a Dynasty if you want to watch the world burn. Walking with Dinosaurs, as we all know, was a huge success, and allowed for more series on prehistory to be made, series that I will most definitely discuss at a later date, and has inspired many people in appreciating the prehistoric world and the field of paleontology, likely to near the same levels as those inspired by Jurassic Park. And with that, I think that is just about all I have to say about Walking with Dinosaurs. Even if it is inaccurate by today's standards, Walking with Dinosaurs is a classic documentary, and I would highly recommend giving this series a rewatch or watch if you haven't seen it before, for both its portrayal of extinct animals as well as for its compelling storytelling and effects. This series means a lot to me and to many others, and I was very glad to have reviewed it. And with that, I thank you for watching this video, and I hope you enjoyed it. If you want to see more from this channel, be sure to subscribe if you haven't already, and I'll see you next time, whenever that may be.